My name's Andrew. Um, I am uh, work at a company called Real World Technology. Uh, we do a range of different things, but I'm here to talk today about uh, a wonderful thing in the Drupal ecosystem, in my opinion, and that's called uh, Drupal Commerce. So uh, you probably, well, you might have heard other people speaking about it a little bit this weekend. Um, it's come up, it's been cursed in some talks, it's been praised in some talks. I think it's one of the best things that's come to the e-commerce community as part of Drupal. But we're gonna have a bit of a chat about that and we're gonna have a look at actually building a working, real, production-ready e-commerce website in pretty much on 25 minutes. Um, so, um, all being well, no computer and technical glitches, that should be all good. So, um, before we actually get into what is Drupal Commerce, I wanted to do a, a quick show of hands. How many of you have built an e-commerce site before? Okay, how many of you have enjoyed the experience? I've got two hands, oh, and a half. <laughs> okay, um, who's used Drupal Commerce before now? Okay, we've got a few people around. Uh, people have used Ubercart. Okay, a few more of you. Um, Magento. Yep. Uh, OS Commerce. Who's written their own? Yep. Uh, things not written in Drupal that do e-commerce. Yep. Anyone use Shopify or those sorts of things? No? Okay. Oh, one. So that, that's good. Okay. Well, Drupal Commerce is a little bit different to most other e-commerce distributions available on the market. Drupal Commerce is really a framework to allow you to build e-commerce stores and e-commerce platforms. Drupal Commerce in and of itself is a bunch of really, really small modules that do a set of small defined contained things. And out of the box, if you just go to drupal.org and grab the commerce project and install it on your site, you're probably going to be finding that what you've got is something that doesn't do a lot, is pretty confusing and a little bit hard to get started with. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today, but the thing about Drupal Commerce that sets it apart from everything else is it's a set of components that allow you to build something big and build something better. So, my background, I've built e-commerce sites. I've been building them since I was about 15. Um, the first e-commerce site I built was a custom-built site. It lived uh, in ASP.NET, uh, I would say ASP. This was before .NET even existed. Um, it uh, sold products for a store. I can't even remember what it did. It had a Microsoft Access database backend because, you know, when you're 15, Access is cool. Um, then you grow up and work out that it really wasn't. Um, but that's okay. <laughs> so that was the first site that I built. Since then, I've built sites using Magento, things built on Zend Framework, some stuff built on Symfony, uh, ran a very large website built in OS Commerce for around five years. Um, and uh, so I've had a bit of an exposure to what's available in terms of e-commerce platforms and building different things. And uh, together with my company, we've built websites for some very, very small people through to some very, very large NGOs and other organizations that wanted to extend uh, their business onto the internet. The thing that I've found time and time again is that when I go and I download something like Magento or I go and I download something like Ubercart, what I discover is that provided what I want to do works straight out of the box, the solution is absolutely perfect. But the moment that my customer comes to me and says what I want is X and Y and Z, and I can't quite do it, the modules don't quite get there, or I can't change what I want, easily, I end up going and hacking something together and making changes and doing things that break my update, upgrade path, that in the end mean that uh, the customer gets a solution that they're not really happy with, and it just becomes a bit of a mess. Now, I see that Drupal Commerce addresses a number of these issues by instead of trying to be something that is all things to all men out of the box, it tries to be building blocks that give you pieces of the bigger puzzle. So it's really cool like that. So what can Drupal Commerce do? Well, it does most of the things that you'd expect an e-commerce platform to do. It manages products and it displays them. It manages orders, it takes payments, it calculates tax, and it can give discounts. And that's what it will do pretty much out of the box. 
We can also do shipping, we can handle stock, we can do coupons and vouchers. And some of those things might not sound like very, very big business goals, but I started using, say, Magento when it was a 0.9 release. And it was the coolest PHP-based uh, shopping cart system available on the market, and probably one of the best that was available at the time. It had a nice UI, a decent customer experience that was really only rivaled by some of the really, really big e-commerce stores. But then we wanted to give coupons for our customers to allow them to buy it. And they only released that module into the community about 12 months ago. That's like three years after the product was there. But Drupal Commerce has it today, there, right now. So, you know, really quite good. So what are people using Drupal Commerce for? Well, there are everyday online stores. So an example up there is ozonkites.com.au. And if you're online, you can go onto that site and jump on there now. It's an Australian-based store. They sell kites. It's pretty cool. Um, Dries mentioned in his keynote this morning, subhub.com. So subhub is, a, is an example which I've come across which is really unique. They have a Drupal-based website that sells Drupal-based websites to sell stuff, which is kind of a bit of inception, but it's pretty good. So um, you can go and you can buy a website from Subhub to uh, sell subscriptions to your magazine or to allow you to download music from your uh, music band thing that you play in or record for or something like that. It's pretty cool. Discount-style websites is another unique thing. Someone has gone and built an entire clone of the Groupon network, a Groupon website, in Drupal Commerce, made it, packaged it up as a Drupal distribution, and you can go download that, install that on your web server, add a bit of theming and bits and pieces, and you've got your own Groupon site. And you can give your friends and family discounts to, I don't know, whatever it is you want to give them discounts to, or however that wants to work. But it's there. It works today, right out of the box. Donation sites, and there's many, many more. So you can go to the Drupal Commerce uh, uh, webpage and look at their showcase, and there's a long list of sites there. And that's only half of what uh, Drupal Commerce is out there in the wild doing today. So one of the things that I promised that we were going to do was to build an awesome e-commerce website in 25 minutes. So let's actually get in and do that, because we've only got 30 40 minutes left in this session. So <laughs> we're going to start with what's called the Commerce Kickstart install profile. Commerce Kickstart is basically a full Drupal 7.10 at the moment distribution with all of the commerce modules and bits and pieces ready to go, which you can download, put on your web server, follow the install script, and have a functional working Drupal Commerce website. But it's really designed for being used in the US. So what we're going to do then is we're going to grab the Commerce Australia module, which has some rules for currency display and GST, and it just makes it easy to get them up and running, and uh, install that. And so that's what we're going to do to start with. So here's where you can go. So this is the Commerce Kickstart page. And here we go. So we're going to install this. So if you've never used an install profile before, uh, you'll see up here we've got uh, the standard, the minimal, and now Commerce Kickstart. So I've pre-downloaded the Commerce Kickstart, put it on my machine, uh, set up a web host, all those sorts of things. Um, there we go. We'll install it in English. Verify requirements. Woo, I passed. Um, database name, DDU3, oh, DDU12 underscore 3, DDU12 underscore 3. Database password. We need to copy that from there because I don't know that. And because I'm lazy, I need to do this too. Save and continue. OK. It's going to run away and it's going to install all of the modules, configure everything as a kind of a base starting point, and get us ready to go. And then once this is finished in a few seconds, we'll get to the configure site. I'll set some settings like you would if you were normally installing Drupal. And then we install some example stuff. And we wait. This is probably the most boring, boring bit. If anyone feels like donating me a faster MacBook Pro, I'll gladly accept. Can I just download the e-commerce Kickstart mod as a straight module? It'll still be the same thing, won't it? Yep. 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 So the advantage that the Commerce Kickstart profile has over, say, going and downloading the Commerce module is that there is a bunch of things that you need to get Commerce working. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but there's a lot of dependencies, which are normal things which you would probably run on your Drupal website. Um, but uh, 
the commerce kickstart, I guess, distribution has those things in it from day one. So you don't need to worry about those sorts of things. You can install it in a Drupal site that you've already got running or bits and pieces. We're just doing this because we have limited time because I set a ridiculous time limit. Um, we're going to call site, uh, I think we're going to sell some Ferraris. Um, and site email address will um, me at andrewyeager.com, username admin. Uh, Actually, we won't use that password. We'll use this one because it's easier. Um, we're in Australia. We're in Melbourne. Save and continue. OK, and we're going to put some example content in because it makes our life easier. And in case you were wondering, we've been going for three minutes in our 25 minutes. And we now have installed Drupal Commerce, and we have a working functional e-commerce store. So I can add products to my cart. I can view my cart. I can make the quantity five. I can update my cart. I can check out. I can fill in some details and go right through, and it will work. But we'll look at that a little bit more later. Of course, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit more than that. And there's a little bit more to be done. So this is what we're actually going to build. We're going to build the Drupal Down Under 2012 Ferrari store. We're going to sell Mickey Mouse cars. We're going to sell Honda Civics and Ferraris, maybe. We'll definitely sell the Ferraris. I'm not so sure about the rest of them. So a couple of things that commerce can do. So one of the nice things is it groups products together like this. So we can have a yellow Ferrari featuring red starbursts. We can have a lime green Ferrari. And you'll notice that as I do this, it updates the displays and it changes the price and the text. Um, you'll see that there's some features on some of these cars somewhere. I think the yellow car features Starburst paint. And they're all updating nicely in the background. And as a uh, website uh, themer and developer and bits and pieces, I've done nothing to get that working out of the box. It ju it's just there. It just happens. It just works. No effort involved, straight up, straight working day one. OK? Um, the other thing that we're going to do, if I actually add this car to my cart, we jump across to the checkout. So we've got our Starburst Ferrari here at $59.95, quantity one. So we've got some shipping in here. Uh, one, two, three, somewhere, street. Uh, yeah, there's no validation on this, whatever. We'll not talk about how to do that today, but it can be done. Okay, we've got some shipping, and we've got two different shipping rules. If you've got a product which you want to sell for less than $100, or oh, sorry, less than $50 in this particular store, you'll get $15 shipping charged. And when you, uh, your cart value is over $50, you get free shipping. So the kind of idea is that you might want to give free shipping to some people, or if they're a particular kind of VIP customer or things like that. All sorts of things that we can do. We can go right through, confirm, put in some payment details, and then magically checkout's complete. I can view my order and see what I've bought. I can go into my account and I can see what I've bought before. I've got a few orders in there, including one that I've deleted and one order that's been completed. I can come in here as an admin, view some orders, see what's been ordered. I can delete an order. I can modify the payment details. So these are sorts of some of the things that you can do with Drupal Commerce straight out of the box, mostly, without too much work. So how do we go about actually getting from a base install to something that is relatively functional, which we can then use to deliver an e-commerce product to our customers? So the first thing that we do is we install commerce. It's relatively straightforward. Then we configure the currency settings. By default, commerce installs running in US dollars. And not that that's really a problem, but you probably want your store, if you're in Australia, to be running in Australian dollars. We set up some tax rules and tax rates. We build our product types, and we'll explain a little bit more about what that is in a moment. We add some sample products. We build product displays. We configure shipping and payment methods. We finish populating our store. We test it, make sure it's doing what we want, and then we push it live and make lots of money because everyone makes money when they launch an online store. Yes. <laughs> OK. The first thing about commerce is that, it, I said before, it makes use of standard Drupal ways of doing things. So there are some key components to commerce which live in the background which aren't immediately obvious that make commerce really, really work and really, really sing when it comes to being a good e-commerce tool. 
The first thing is rules. Rules drive Drupal Commerce. Rules are your business logic that determines how your e-commerce store works. So you have rules to calculate tax. You have rules to determine whether you can add a product to your cart. You have rules that set what shipping methods you can choose. You have rules which determine whether or not the user is allowed to check out. You have a rule, and there's actually a screenshot of one here, that determines what emails get sent to the customer when they purchase the item, and whether or not you as a store admin get the email. You have rules which integrate Drupal Commerce with your back-end ERP system. So if you have something like uh, at Empire or you're making use of a uh, financial package like, say, Xero or Sasu or something like that, someone can write modules which interact with those rules that then when, say, someone completes an order, it triggers the invoice to be created in Xero, the payment to be recorded, and all of those things fit together very, very nicely. Now, no one's done that yet, but it's entirely possible within the way that Drupal Commerce works. The next thing to say about Drupal Commerce is that it relies heavily on views. So views is a way of representing data within your website. Uh, if you've got, you can have views that display nodes, you can have views that display all kinds of different things. One of the really neat things about Drupal Commerce is that pretty much whenever it displays a list of stuff, it's using views. So if you want to change the columns which you see. One of the common things that customers say to me is, we've got a website, we've got an admin section, we've got our product listing, and we want to change the order of these. So uh, take something like Magento. You can print out a picking, ship, uh, a picking list out of Magento, which uh, by default shows the product code, product name, price, and that's about all. And if you want to change that, you've got to change a bunch of stuff that, uh, you've got to change a bunch of XML files, you've got to change a bunch of uh, PHP files to change the way that that all comes together. It's a little bit messy, a little bit nasty. With Drupal Commerce, you jump in, you edit the view, you add the column, and you're done. It's really nice, really, really easy. You want to display the SKU, so the part code of a product in the shopping cart. You just go and you add the column, because that's the way that it works. It's really, really nice because it makes use of standard Drupal features that people that are used to building and assembling Drupal websites use every day and know. The next thing to say is products are not nodes. If you're coming from a Drupal 6 mindset where everything's a node, it's really important to understand that products are not nodes. Products are products and they're displayed using nodes. And we'll talk about product displays in a minute. But a product is essentially a group of fields, which is a group of information about a product. So a product must contain an SKU, which is a part code. A product must contain a name. And a product can, but doesn't have to, contain a price. Most products will contain a price. Although sometimes people want stores where they don't actually want to sell anything. They just want to put products online. So those kinds of things are there. But say you wanted to record the color of an item. You can add a field to your product type that has the color in it, much in the way that you could add a field to your content type to record the information. But they're distinct from product types. But product displays group products together into logical groups. So an example which I've been kind of thinking through is, say I was an Apple reseller and wanted to sell iPhones. Okay? There's currently eight or nine different models of iPhones you can get. But what I want to do is have someone come to my online store and be able to pick up, uh, go to the iPhone page and have all of the different options listed there together in one place for them to be able to go and see. I don't really want them to be able to go to a page that has the 32 gig iPhone on it, the 64 gig iPhone in black and white, and there's way more than six models I've just realized. I want them all grouped together into a single node. So that's what a product display is. It groups products together in a form for display. And you can add extra information there. You can add product descriptions. In fact, any field you want to add to a product display, you can. Currency is the next thing which we'll talk about. Drupal Commerce is actually multi-currency aware. So if you wanted to sell products in Australian dollars and US dollars and New Zealand dollars and British pounds and uh, yen or whatever it is you want to do, Drupal Commerce day one out of the box supports multiple currencies. 
by default, it does has no way of converting between currencies. So if you put prices in in Australian dollars, it won't go and work out what the price is in US dollars or something like that. But you can do that if you wanted to. And there's no reason why, uh, well, most people probably wouldn't want to do that because they want to put it in nice numbers. So I want to sell it for $49.95 in Australia and $199.95 in the US or however that works. Um, and which currency people see can be selected using rules. So you could have a geo, so, so there are modules which will tell rules what country someone's in. And then rules can determine on the basis of that what currency someone should see on their store. Um, the other thing about, the other thing which we'll quickly touch on is taxes. So um, in Australia, tax system is relatively boring. We have one tax rate for pretty much everything. It's called GST. It's about 10% of the product price. Most of you probably deal with that when you go and buy everything you buy. Um, in other countries, there are other tax rules. Um, but say you wanted to sell houses using Drupal Commerce. In New South Wales, where I'm from, uh, we have this thing called stamp duty. And stamp duty is 1.5% of the sale price. So you could have a tax rate for stamp duty within Drupal Commerce, know when to calculate that stamp duty using rules, and correctly apply it to the products all automatically without ever having to deal anything. So you can have multiple tax rates, multiple tax types, you can display taxes including, excluding, all those sorts of things. You can have tax rates not on. So in fact, kind of self-plug here, the Commerce Australia module, which you can go and download from drupal.org, um, when you turn on the GST uh, thing that is within the Commerce Australia module, it actually has a rule in there which says, if you're in Australia, charge GST, and if you're not in Australia, don't charge GST. Because if you ship the product outside of Australia, then you don't charge GST on it. And that, you know, I used to run a website in OS Commerce, that was a big pain whenever someone placed an order from New Zealand. Because we had to take the GST off and modify it and a bunch of things like that, and it didn't do it well, and then we tried it in Ubercart and it was even worse. So, just works out of the box day one, great to go. So let's actually get in and do this. We've got 25 minutes from now, maybe with some time for questions. And by the way, feel free to stop me at any time and ask questions on what we're doing. So this is the website which we just installed. The first thing that we're going to do is actually not jump into configuration, is jump into modules. And uh, the first thing which I'm going to actually do is I'm going to install the module filter module simply because it makes my life a lot easier. Um, if you've never, if you've worked with a, a site that has lots of modules and you've never found the module filter module, what it does is it changes the display of this page and puts the modules down on the left hand side. It's really handy. It's kind of quick. So the first thing which we're going to do is install the GST module and while we're at it we'll probably also install the currency display, standard Australian currency display. Okay. They're part of the Commerce Australia um, module. And what they do is, so the GST module sets up default GST rules for the store. And currency display uh, makes it display Australian dollars with a dollar sign. That's pretty much all that they do. Pretty basic, but important. Now we're going to configure our store. So the first thing which we do is we set the currency. Going to jump in here, see the default is in US dollars. We're going to move that to Australian dollars, because we're in Australia. We'll save that. Now, what that's done, that's enabled the Australian currency in here, but we no longer really want to have US dollars available for our store, so we'll just turn it off. Okay, first step done. The next thing that we'll do is we'll just have a look at the taxes. We don't need to do it because the tax rates have already set it up for us. We have a tax type in here, it's called GST. If we have a look at it, it displays taxes of this type included in the price. It's got some rounding rules. It's called goods and services tax. And we've got a tax rate, which is actually the GST. And it's 10% because that's what GST is. We can make it 20%, 50%, 150%, 0.1%, all sorts of things. I don't know why you'd ever want to do that, but you can. Um, I'm sure there are countries in the world where that's an important option to be able to have. Okay, so that's the basic configuration. The next thing which we're going to do is we're going to build our products. So we click on view products and there's three default products in because we use the commerce kickstart install and we told it to install the de demonstration products. 
but our Ferrari store is going to sell cars. So we want to go and configure it to sell cars. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a product type. We're going to call it a car. We're going to make it a really cool car that we can sell. And we're going to save and add some fields. So by default, you can see we've got the SKU. So that's the part code. We've got the title. We've got a price, which we can delete if we wanted to. We've got a status, which is whether or not the product is enabled or anything else like that. So you can just disable the product. And what we're going to do now is we're going to add a field for color. And it's going to be a list of text types. It's select list. We'll save that. This is relatively manual, but we're doing it real, so we'll go through. Um, allowed value list. Here's one I prepared earlier. Got to take some shortcuts. And now we'll save that, and that's done. The other thing which we're going to do, we're going to add some features for our cars which we want to sell. So we're going to make it a um, we're actually going to make it a text field, and we're going to allow multiple values once we get through. Da -de -da -de -da. Number of values unlimited. And of course, we want a photo of our cars here. And there's an existing field which we can use called product image, which we'll just drag up. And we might actually put that there. For, uh, we'll put it in after the price because we can. We'll save it as an image. Uh, it doesn't have to be required. Yeah, that'll all do. You can play with the settings a bit later. OK, we've got a product type. So let's go and add some cars. So there's a bit of a quick navigation bar thing here. There's an Add Product button I could have clicked on. We've got two options. We can use the standard product type. We're going to use the Create Car. Call it an F1. We'll call this one a red Ferrari. We'll sell that for $49.95, including GST, bargain Ferrari. Get them while you can. Limited stock available. Um, we'll go for our red Ferrari. We'll upload that. We'll set the color to be ruby red. And this one can have mag wheels. And we'll save and add another. And we'll repeat this, F2. This can be our pink Ferrari. And we'll sell this one for $59.95. In case you're wondering why we have a pink Ferrari, I asked a bunch of people what color Ferraris they wanted. And Donna Benjamin said she wanted a pink Ferrari. So um, we got that. So penultimate pink. Um, this is going to be just for Donna. And we'll save and add another one. Uh, product SKU, we're up to F3. Uh, I think, I don't know what colors I have left. We'll go for color this way. We'll go for a lime green Ferrari. And this is because Peter said that he wanted a lime green Ferrari. And we'll call this lime green Ferrari. And we'll sell this one for $199.95. It's a bit of a premium model. And we'll upload the image, because I forget to do that sometimes. And it is lusciously good lime green. It's alliteration for you in case you didn't notice. And this one has no features because it's boring. And the last one, which is actually my favorite, this is my yellow Starburst Ferrari. I'm sorry if you're a Ferrari lover. We're going to sell this for $499.99, including GST. We're going to grab my Starburst Ferrari, click Upload, and you can see it there. Beautiful. It's yellow with red Starbursts all over it. Um, and it is a Yamarific yellow Ferrari featuring Starburst paint. And while we're here, we'll add another um, feature. Uh, I don't know. We can have a four-wheel drive Ferrari. That sounds great. <laughs> OK. We've got four products. Wonderful. They're in our store. But hang on a second. They're not showing up. Does anyone know why they're not showing up yet? Yes. That's right. Those Ferraris are not included in a product display. So we're now going to add a product display. We're going to call it a Ferrari. Ferraris are cool. You should buy one. There's a reason why I don't write copy. OK. And here, this is where we set up our links to our products. So we've got an F1. We've got an F2, an F3, and an F4. So you can put as many products as you want, all separated by commas in there. It's an autocomplete field. It's nice. It just works. You can have one. You can have 10. It doesn't matter. You have 100 if you wanted. I don't know what it performs like if you have 100. Probably still fine. And we'll save that. And we'll save that. All good. OK. And here's our Ferrari. 
it's red, I can choose yellow Starburst Ferrari. I wanted to do this just because I wanted to show you what the yellow Starburst Ferrari looks like in all of its glory. And I just selected that here and you can see the features updated, the color updated, haven't done anything particularly special to make that happen. We just added the fields to the product type, we added them to the standard product display straight out of the box and that's what happens and that works. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Now, we're going to do a couple of nice little things. We don't actually like the product image being that big. So we're going to format that a little bit. We're going to manage the display, the default display of the product image. Now, this is where it gets a little bit messy. You modify the display settings for each field on the product type display settings, not on the product display settings. Okay? There are some things you modify in the product display, but you modify these ones on the product type. Okay, so we're going to make this one image type. We're going to display a medium image because it fits nicely. And we're going to hit save. And we'll close that. And page refreshes. And there we go. Okay. So good so far? All good. So now the next thing which we're going to do is we're going to come in here. And we're going to modify our shopping cart a little bit. So I mentioned that this is all built around views. So I'll just give you a bit of an example of what we can do. We're going to edit the view here. And what I want to do is I want to add the product code into the shopping cart so that when I come to view the card, I can see what the model number is at the shopping cart stage. So we're going to add a field and we're going to add the SKU field. Hang on, it's not in the list. This is the first little bit of magic which I need to show you. So we're going to cancel out there. We're going to use the relationships to add a relationship to the commerce, uh, to the product. Um, uh, that's not actually the one I want. I want the car. No, hang on. I think maybe that is the one I want. Add and configure relationships. Apply. Okay. So we've got a reference now theoretically to the product. So when I come in here and I choose add, I should now have an option for SKU. There we go, it's in there. Product is linked, that's where the relationship is. Create a label, we'll rearrange that and we want it to appear first because that's a nice place for it to appear. We'll apply that, we'll save our view, come back and now we've got the SKU. Product 03 is in our cart. Okay, if we wanted to show features of a product in there or anything like that, we do follow exactly the same process. So if you wanted to, um, if I come back and I add a uh, red Ferrari to my cart um, and come across to the checkout and I wanted to show the colour in here, I could do exactly the same thing, add the colour field in the column uh, using views and it all just happens all nicely, all straight away, no particular work to make that happen. Okay, that's pretty much what we need to do. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to play with shipping. And shipping is the first time where I'm actually going to show you a little bit of how rules works to configure the logic of our online store. So first thing we're going to do, we're going to jump into modules. We're going to grab the commerce shipping module. We're going to turn on the flat rate module and the base shipping module. And the shipping UI, because that's how we configure it. And we're going to save these things. Click save configuration. Whenever you're ready. As I said, if anyone wants to buy me a faster MacBook Pro, I'm, I'm all, all willing. Um, sorry? Or just, or just solid state, that's right. So if we're going to configure our shipping, we click on, conf on configure store. Come in, click on shipping, uh, relatively self-explanatory. And what we're going to do is we're going to configure two shipping services. We're going to configure a shipping service that is a uh, standard shipping, which we'll call standard shipping. We'll sell it for $15 including GST. We'll save that. And we're also going to add a service that is free shipping. Free shipping, $0 including GST. Save flat rate. It could be $0 excluding GST. It doesn't really matter. Okay. And now when we come in here, all of a sudden we've got our shipping information option. We popped this in last time. Continue to the next step. 
We've got options. We can choose our shipping type. We can get free shipping or standard shipping. I don't know why I'd ever want to choose free shipping, standard shipping if I've got free shipping as an option. So let's now build some rules which determine when those should be displayed. And then we'll test them, make sure that they work, and go from there. So we'll click on shipping. We'll click on shipping services. And we're going to use this configure component link to modify the rules which determine when this gets displayed. So the free shipping, we're going to add a rate for shipping service to an order, but only when we do a data comparison and we discover that the commerce order, commerce order total amount is lower than, hold on, we're doing free shipping, aren't we? Yes. So is, we'll do it this way, is lower than, oh, what do you reckon? $150? Okay. Worth knowing a little trick of the trade, when you do this data comparison, it is done in cents, not done in dollars. Okay? And this particular rule isn't multi-currency aware and it can be done, but that's just too complicated for now, so we won't worry about that. So if the order is less than $150, well, we don't actually want to give them free shipping. We want to not give them free shipping. There's a reason why we did that. I'll explain in a moment. We'll come in and we'll make the opposite rule for the standard shipping. Add condition, data comparison. We're going to commerce order, commerce order total uh, amount. We're going to click continue and is lower than $150. That's what we set it to, right? There we go, it's there. And we'll leave that there. Okay, now the reason why we set one rule as less than $150 not and one rule as less than $150 is because there's no less than or equal comparison for the data comparison rule. It's the only reason why we did it that way. So if someone buys $150 worth of something, if we set one to be less than $150 and one to be greater than $150, if your order costs $150, there's no shipping option available to you and that's just a bit of a pain. So that's why you do it that way. Um, you could build quite complicated rules. You can have multiple conditions, you can have ors, you can have ands, all of those sorts of things. You can nest the conditions against each other and pretty much anything can be compared and rules is way complicated and there's brilliant uh, screencasts online and if you're writing rules go online watch the screencasts and then when you're thoroughly confused jump on IRC that's pretty much the way to go and by the way just while we're here if you're looking for an IRC client and you use a Mac and you haven't found one you like there's this great thing in the App Store called textual I found it this week it actually makes IRC usable in my opinion so I really like it I'm chat does it as well okay cool Awesome. So we've now got shipping in our store. And let's actually just prove that that works. We've got free shipping on this order. So let's go back and let's modify our shopping cart, which presumably I can do by clicking cancel and come in here. And so it was $150. So let's remove these. So they're going to charge me shipping on my Ferrari. What a ripoff. Seriously. I could have just changed the quantity, but I removed the very expensive item from my cart. So now my order's only whatever it was, $15. So there we go. I've got goods and services tax on there. I've got standard shipping at $13.64 XGST. You can change the order of those fields. We'll talk about that later. Pop in a payment. Um, blah. Continue to the next step. Order done. We're actually done. We've built our online store. It's fully functional beginning to end in under 25 minutes. Just hang on a second, we'll get the microphone. Andrew, can you configure the shipping just based on the postcode? Can you, yes, you can make the shipping built on any rule. So you can do instead of a quantity-based um, uh, comparison, you can do an address-based comparison, um, much in the same way that we do an address-based comparison to determine the tax rate. So I'll show you what the rule might look like by showing you the tax rule, stores. Here's the other place you can get to the rules in configuration workflow rules. So this is just using the rules module that's built into Drupal. And so in here we have a calculate taxes GST rule and it's the default rule. And in here, so we've got a condition, it's an order address component comparison. 
And in here we've got uh, commerce line item order, address, country, blah, 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 blah. Now, keep in mind we're using the flat rate shipping module here. Most of the time, if you're doing postcode based shipping, your shipping is probably calculated from an external service like Australia Post Shipping Calculator, or you're making use of in Australia Star Trek Express or TNT or uh, any of the other big shipping companies. And they have APIs which they can expose, which then someone can write a module, whether that be yourself or someone that actually knows stuff about writing modules, whatever that is, um, to integrate those things together. There is an Australia Post module in Sandbox on Drupal. I don't know if it's been released. I don't know if it works. So, yeah. Can I, um, I just got two questions for you. Yes. Um, one is if you've currently got an existing site in Drupal 7 yep. um, and you want to turn it into a commerce site, yep. um, how relatively, like from what I've looked at, it looks pretty relatively easy to just drop the commerce modules in there and yep. then turn those nodes into products. Yep, that's pretty yep. much all you need to do. Okay, so and um, oh, sorry, go on. I was going to say the thing to keep in mind is there are dependencies for the commerce module, so you will also be running C tools, views, yep. rules, and a bunch of things like that, which most people are probably running anyway. Um, and just one other question what, if you've got a site that's currently in Drupal 6 Ubercart. Yep. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not as sorry as I am, I've got to work with it. <laughs> um, what would your recommendations be um, for getting it into commerce, just literally starting from scratch again? Yeah, so yeah. I'm talking about this with one of my clients at the moment who has a quite uh, heavily hacked version of Ubercart running their website. Um, it's running a slightly older version of Ubercart that hasn't had security patches applied to it for a little while, which makes me a little bit nervous. Um, and so we are talking about the fact that we need to get to Drupal Commerce with them at some stage over the next year. And we're going to rebuild it from the ground up. So I'll repeat the question. Um, is it so when you're doing that, okay, my biggest fear was for doing that and why I kept it in Drupal 6 was basically exporting all the, or like maintaining all the orders yeah. and product connections and user connections because that was something that was really neat. Yeah. What? Yeah, I mean, so... It would be pretty much nearly quite difficult for me to extract that and then drop that in 7. Look, I imagine it would be a relatively trivial module to export from Ubercart to Drupal 7 Commerce end of the world. No one's written it yet. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time in the tables in Ubercart. They're not all that sophisticated, so you know it could be done, um, but it's not something that... It's probably not something for the faint-hearted. Um, we're going to start again. So we're going to re-input all the products, we're going to re-input all the data, we're going to recreate the users, and you know that is a problem with choosing to run your business logic out of a web-based e-commerce platform is what is the upgrade path. Um, the guys that wrote Drupal Commerce were the same guys that wrote Ubercart. And in one of the first presentations they gave publicly on Drupal Cart, the very first thing that they said was sorry. <laughs> so um, Ubercart is great provided it does what you want. And if it doesn't do what you want, then it's a little bit messy. And the migration path is not so nice. Same with thing with Drupal Commerce though. There is a lot of things it doesn't do. And I started using Drupal Commerce when the first RC or beta was released um, about 12 months ago. We half built a site, discovered we got stuck because a bunch of things weren't working and we stopped. And a lot of people have started working with Drupal Commerce just a little too early. I think in the last three months is sort of when it's really got to a point where it's mature enough and stable enough that most of the things which you want are mostly there and mostly working. Um, but it is a work in progress and the community is quite happy to help. So get online and contribute. Last question. Um, so where is all the link to the payment stuff? Does it link to PayPal and where do you configure that? Yep, okay, so I haven't turned on any payment methods in this example store, except for the example payment method which is turned on by default. There is a PayPal payment method, there is a authorised.net payment method, there's secure pay for Australia, uh, there's a bunch of different payment gateways which uh, developers have written and made available on Drupal.org. Um, and if you want a payment gateway that isn't there, it's relatively trivial to write one to put in there or to find a developer. There's a few good developers in Australia that work with uh, Drupal Commerce that are happy to write payment gateways if someone pays them because they have to put food on their table. I think that's about it.
Okay, if you'd like to thank Andrew. Thank you.